Hi, I'm Christina, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm also a recovering fentanyl and Xanax addict. Um, I'd like to start telling a little bit about my testimony and my background. I was raised here in the Midwest, um, come from a typical family, blue collar. My mother, she worked at a factory with my father. My father was an alcoholic, so one of my very first memories was when I was five years old, I was actually back against a microwave and my brother who was 13 years my senior was protecting me because my father was abusive towards him but I was daddy's princess. Um, I stuttered a lot through school and had to go to speech therapy and everybody had to talk slow like this. And eventually, um, my mom divorced my dad, and she got with my stepdad, and our life changed completely. My stepdad came from a little bit more upper class, and we come from a house where, like, swearing was just a regular vocabulary word to there was no swearing. And the next thing I know, my mom decides she's going to no longer work at the factory. She's going to go to beauty school. So when she makes that decision, um, I start going over to my aunt's house, which would be her sister. And during the next, so I'm five years old at this time, so for the next five years of my life, I began um, getting sexually molested by my uncle, who was also a preacher. So it was like a really difficult time for me at times um, because I felt like I had no one and it was a big secret like nobody knew and he didn't really threaten me or anything like that but it ends up coming out through one of his daughters he had five children that there was suspected child molestation going on and uh i remember my mother walking into the house and went up to him after he had just got done molesting me and she had no idea and her looking him in the eyes and saying jerry you would never touch any of your children I don't know why she would ever say that. So I kept that secret going into like my young adolescence. And um, about 12 years old, my brother, he's off and on into prison at this time from everything that's happened in his childhood. And uh, I felt pretty alone because my mom spent a lot of time with my stepdad and I have this dark secret. So I start going over to a cousin's house and um, I really kind of looked at her almost like an aunt, so if I refer to her as an aunt, that's how I refer to her. But I start babysitting the kids there, and uh, I feel like I fit in. There's 10 of us. Um, she has catering business. I'm learning how to cook. I'm having a great time in my life. And during that point, um, she was a known drug dealer when I had no idea, so she... Asked me if I like to smoke weed. I start smoking weed. Then I start selling weed. And later I end up selling cocaine all by the age of 15. So I start selling drugs. But I, I get good grades. So with good grades, um, I make it through school. And then I end up getting into a relationship with my first daughter's, my first daughter's father at the age of 19. And when I had Jaslyn... My whole life changed. Um, she was beautiful. I end up still going to college. I get a great job. Everything's fine in life. And then his side of the parents, his mom and dad, hit the lottery. So when they hit the lottery, life changes completely and he spirals into a drug addiction. And I'm like, not going for it. So we separate. I'm still working. I'm still working at the bank. I'm starting to make a name for myself. Probably the best job I would have ever had in my life. And uh, then I meet my second daughter's father and we spend 12 years together. And this is where I get into a very toxic codependent relationship. And this relationship is, is terrible. It is, um, I said it was made in the pits of hell. <laughs> um, he wasn't abusive physically to me, but we just were just so toxic and codependent. Um, multiple uh, affairs going on. And then um, 
during this time, I decide to try to separate from him and I'm going to move back toward home so I can have help with the kids. At this time, my brother, he's been out of prison, he's homeless and volunteers to help trying to watch my kids so I can keep my career going and um, life seems to be getting a little bit better. Well, I didn't know that my brother was a heroin addict. So uh, the type of company that's coming over and some of my friends, I had no idea because I'm, I'm 27 at this point in my life and I had never really been around hard drug use. But I start going to the doctor for um, depression and anxiety and they prescribe me this magic pill called Xanax. And from the point that I get on the Xanax, I start, I like the way they make me feel. They make me completely numb. I forget all the problems. I forget everything that's going on with my life, with my uh, failing marriage, everything. And um, the Xanax was, I would say, is my first real addiction. And then later on, I was introduced to heroin. Um, my, my two childhood best friends come over for a New Year's Eve party in 2015. And um, one was a registered nurse. The other one actually worked for Child Protective Services. And then here was me, a business solution specialist at the bank. Um, that night, our lives changed. We all tried heroin um, for the first time. We didn't inject it or anything. And I realized this was the love of my life, I thought, at the time. Um, it completely, utterly was, it just was what I had been looking for at that point, which was total numbness to everything that had gone on in my life. Um, several, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit here. Um, pretty much rapidly, I'm 36 now, and from the time that I was 27, I now have um, two felonies, pretty serious felonies. I, I went to prison for drug dealing. I've overdosed 30 times. I've lost 50 friends, one including my brother and one including my baby cousin that I helped raise at that aunt's house. Um, you just never know, like, you just don't realize what's going on at that point in your life when that's all going on. It's almost like a movie and, but you can't stop watching or a train wreck that's going on. And, uh, when I lost my brothers, when I really went off the deep end, um, it was just a nightmare. And, uh, I remember at one point I was praying upstairs because I was just at wit's end. At this point, I remember Toby died in 2000. Let's see. He was born in August. And he died August 16th, 2017. And um, that fall, that winter, we didn't have any money for presents for the kids. Electricity is about to get shut off. We have no money. I'm selling drugs. Um, at one point, my cousin, one of my, another cousin had given me even a cell phone to give my oldest daughter for Christmas. I sold that for drugs. I was just at complete wit's end. And I remember doing a cry out to God. And um, when I cried out to God, I remember I was so angry. And I was, I feel like there's stages of praying. There's some where you're just asking and seeking and knocking. And so this was a knocking prayer. And this is when God really first revealed himself to me. And um, when he revealed himself to me, it was very strong. And I don't usually tell this story because some people probably don't believe it. But there is power in prayer. And when this happens, I'm getting really upset. And I'm quoting the Bible and things. And at one point, I said, you took my brother from me. And I was not even able to say goodbye and I said, and you've also removed the only other person in my life that means something to me, my cousin JJ, which is who I sold the cell phone from. And I said, and he's out of my life. I said, I have nobody. I said, I have nothing. I was like, still nothing, big guy? I was like, that's what I thought. And so I'm sitting on my bed, and anybody who's went through opiate um, sickness, day three and four is usually the worst. So I'm sick. I, I haven't really slept. I can't eat. I'm extremely sick. I'm in the super flu phase. And I opened my eyes and my brother was in a full apparition in front of me. He did not speak. He did not talk. I could not move. And one minute he was there, the next he was gone. 
I don't do any hallucinant drugs. I don't do anything like that. So I know what I'm seeing was something supernatural. I go downstairs and my ex-husband at the time was like, Christina, I swear, if you're up to no good and if you're trying to do something sneaky, it's like three o'clock in the morning, it's a blizzard outside. He said, if you're up to something that's not good, he's like, I'm taking these kids and I'm divorcing you. And I said, you don't understand my brother's here. He said, he, there's no way he can be. He's like, go back upstairs. So I go back upstairs and I'm trying to process what's going on. And about, it couldn't even be 10 minutes later, there's a knock at the door. It's three o'clock in the morning. All I hear is, it's your cousin JJ, open up the door. I wouldn't open the door. I was so embarrassed of the state I was in, but my ex-husband did. And he said, tell her to come down here right now. And I go downstairs and he said, I was at home. He goes, and I was trying to go to sleep. I was watching wrestling in my bed. He goes, and you came over my mind so heavy. Something told me I had to come down here and check on you. And he had offered to pay for me to go to any rehab in the country. And I said, you're not going to believe it. And he said, what? I said, I'm not even sick anymore. Like he had taken every symptom I had of the, of the withdrawal way. I said, I don't even need to go. And then this was my first stint of sobriety. I had six months of sobriety on my own after that. So we're going to cruise forward. I go to prison. All of that happens, which was an absolute terrible experience, but I will share one thing, um, about that. So during that time I went to prison, I did divorce my ex-husband and I, I was so focused on what the judge had said to me at the time that he had sentenced me, which was, Miss Phrase, I believe that everything that you have said to me is sincere and genuine. That you, But as soon as someone waves money or a bag of fentanyl in front of your face, all of your hopes, morals, and self-respect go out the window. Prove me wrong. So during that three and a half years that I was in prison, Every day I would repeat that to myself and I said, I'm going to change who I am. I'm going to change who I am. But I wasn't trying to seek God at that point. I was seeking myself. I had in my mind, I got myself into this. I can get myself out. You are the one who destroyed your life. You're the one who's going to fix it. You're the one who, you know, has all this debt. You're the one who's going to have to fix it. So I get out. I get, I overwork myself. I work three jobs, 90 hours a week. I gain a significant amount of weight. I gain 125 pounds, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm not a supermodel. And um, I, that's all I was focused on, was proving everybody wrong, proving that I was going to be a, uh, not a debt to society anymore. And um, so I go ahead and I, I'm in that kind of mindset, and then I meet who is my next husband. I had I was just had myself up on this pedestal that I had conquered addiction. I had the recipe. I had the tools, and it's all within yourself. And um, so he, I had like a blog where people would follow me for recovery advice and things like that, and. We started talking and I end up marrying him actually. He's a great guy, but he was still struggling in and out of battles of addiction. And several things happen here, which I think is a really key point to anybody that is in recovery is never get too complacent where you're at. If you're comfortable, I question if you're growing and the grass isn't always greener on the other side. It's greener where you choose to water it. And if there was a cookie cutter at aspect to making you not an addict we would all go buy that same cookie cutter but guess what there isn't a cookie cutter there isn't a magical recipe in that area it's, you're not going to find it in yourself so I wasn't prepared for what was going to happen next in my life so the first big thing that happens is is the county that I had committed that offense after two years of being sober wanted me to come back and do six months of house arrest they would not let me pay to transfer it. I, they would let me pay and transfer my probation, but not the house arrest. So off I go. Go back to the county. And I go back into a situation where I go home for the first time since I was 19 years old. I go home. And my mother was in an affair at the point, And 
this man was an alcoholic. So I go back into a home of addiction, not of my drug of choice, but that was trigger number one. Then guess what happens? Because I no longer live in Indianapolis, I move back to this small rural area. I end up losing, they transfer me from the warehouse that I worked at into like a small branch and I have to file an SR-22 on my driver's license. Well, they never did a thorough background check and things like that on me because I already worked for the company. They find out I have SR-22. They fire me on the spot. Now I'm not making good money anymore. I'm not making 26 bucks an hour anymore. Now I'm going to have to go and work in this rural area for less money. That was strike number two. The third strike was, is my then husband relapses. It's like, so what happens now? I'm already, I was already going back into addiction mode, not even realizing the red flags that were going off. I was, I stopped going to my meetings. I stopped doing all these things because I felt like I was comfortable and I was better. Well, guess what? It landed me right back where I started. And I was just so grateful that during this time, in that short amount of time I had relapsed was about four months. And, uh, I had overdosed 13 times during that time, but God didn't give up on me. He had a plan. And um, it ended up winding me going right back to jail on a probation violation, and which led me into going into crossroads. For the first time ever, that county granted me something in my favor to do something better for me, and that was to send me here. And then during that time that I've been in this program, I cannot express the amount of gratitude and thanksgiving I have for this ministry and the love that I've had and the support system that I have. Friendships that are based on real friendships, not based on money or what you can do for me or what you have for me. These are real genuine friendships and to prepare me for what's going to happen. Um, there's a quote in 1 Peter that says to be sober-minded, to be vigilant because your adversary is like a roaring lion waiting on you to see who it's going to devour. And I can't tell you how that feels because that's true because right now I'm in a safe place, but I have to prepare for what's next for me, what, what's going to happen once I'm outside of these walls. But I just know one thing that I, that I have Jesus in my heart now and I don't feel alone and I'm able to conquer these battles now. And it's not by myself that, that it's not anything good that is within me. It's all from him that shines out of me and to see the restoration take place with my family and my children and to people to see that difference and to be a leader and to help engage the women that come through these doors and to give them the courage to stay and to fight those demons and to to actually see that change in that short amount of time. I tell you, the four months that I've walked with Jesus was easier than that two years that I was out there trying to do it on my own. And I thank you for your time and I hope this helps somebody. And if you need help, please reach out because it's never, it's, it's never too early to try to get help because one day it just might be too late.